Let us go to the speaking constitution. Yes, sir. Uh, in the morning, you had a serious discussions and debate with your fellow, fellow professor. Yes. Commissioner Professor Gidu Mugai on Article 166. And uh, I need to remove some cobwebs and I need to get some clarifications from you. Mm. And I request that you open your constitution. Yes. 166. At 1662. Mm. 1662. Mr. Professor, you will agree with me that uh, Article 166 deals with the uh, appointment of the Chief Justice, Deputy Chief Justice, and other judges. Yes. Uh, Article 166.2 is the primary qualification for all judges. Is the primary yes. qualification for all judges. Yes. And it says each judge of superior court shall be appointed from among, and it has three conditions mm. or three requirements. Mm. Then uh, it has three conditions for the position of the Chief Justice and the Deputy Chief Justice. Mm. It has three conditions for Court of Appeal judges. It has three conditions for High Court judges. Mm. Let us simplify the issues. I want you to simplify the issue for me. Mm. And uh, in doing so, I want you to address whether Article 1662 mm. and uh, 663 are separate, supplemental, they are composite or different in interpreting. Because 1662 and 1663. Yes. Mm. Yes. Is it that you must first of all satisfy the first hurdle, which is 1662, mm. or that uh, 1662 is supplemental or is composite in terms of your qualification? Um, the way I read um, uh, this section, uh, this article rather, um, what I see there is I see 1663 as an explication of 1662. It's simply a further elucidation. Further elucidation. Yes. If it is a further elucidation of 1662 mm. and uh, 1662 has three requirements. Yes. Is it your case that each of the three requirements are separate or must be read together? This or they is, are different? Uh, this is uh, judge, you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't see. I'm asking this question because I didn't uh, get the. Yes, yes. I, I didn't get the professorial debate. Yes, no, 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 no. And, and you are taking us to task for sure. Um, mm. Um, I th so one reading of this section, uh, 1662, is that all of those um, 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 uh, limbs, A, B, and C, stand alone. The other reading could be that they stand together. Uh, the reason why one might say they stand alone is because uh, when you look at 1662, uh, is silent on whether they stand alone or they stand together. It doesn't say and, it doesn't say all of, uh, 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 you know, the following, uh, or all know, of them. Why, why I'm asking, uh, Professor, is that uh, yes. uh, 1662 mm. at its end says under, then now list further requirement for all the three courts, superior courts. 
Yes, uh, yes, and, but still that will not change the fact that, uh, that the drafters did not give us guidance on, on whether they should be read com together or whether they should be read, be read as standing alone. And that's all I'm saying. I mean, I think it is possible that, that uh, either, either interpretation for me would work. And uh, you know, you are the law professor, mm. and uh, you need to clarify this issue. Yes. Especially, you know, the three requirements yes. are very specific. Yes. And it doesn't use the word or. It says one, two, and then the last one, it says under. Yes. Um, no, I see that. I, I still see that. But I, I, I say, like I said, I think it's a very gray area. So where do you fall yourself? Um, in, in, in 1662? Yes. Um, I follow, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm under, obviously under A. And uh, of course under C. And under C. Um, and I would even say under B. B. Okay. I, I would say under B, and why I would say that is I would actually argue very vociferously <coughs> With uh, okay, you know, your, your, your Highness, I would argue that actually under 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 one six six two B, my work with the Kenya Human Rights Commission disqualifies fine. Okay. And uh, secondly, there has been an argument about the role of the Supreme Court. Yes, and that was an issue raised with you by Commissioner Deche. Yes, that you are not fit, I'm not sorry to use the word that, that you are not ripe mm. for that court because mm. you have never practiced in Kenya. Mm. Uh, you have never taught law here in Kenya. Mm. And uh, this is primarily a court which has an exclusive jurisdiction on the issue of presidential petition. Mm. And there are a lot of, of gray areas as to how to conduct a presidential petition. Time is 14 days. It's not clear whether to use uh, affidavit evidence. It's not clear whether uh, the, the issue of the standard of proof or the burden of proof should be lowered because of standard, uh, because of the affidavit evidence that was used the last time. Yes. What is your view? I, um, first of all, let me just say that, um, I mean, uh, I'm not trying to antagonize the judges in the room because that would be a mistake. Uh, but uh, uh, let me say that uh, in terms of sitting um, uh, as a judge on the Supreme Court hearing a petition, a presidential petition, uh, it, it, it does not, uh, it is not obvious to me that having been a judge for 30 years uh, is much better than having been an academic, a legal academic for 30 years. I don't want to kind of uh, put, put a hierarchy on those two e experiences. The Constitution itself gives us guidance and it regards 15 years experience as an academic as sufficient. Uh, so unless we want to go back and say the framers were, were wrong. Uh, uh, as a matter of the intellect, I think hearing a petition, it's a very intellectual exercise. Uh, in fact, I would say an academic is very well trained, a legal academic, to deal with that question. Uh, but let me just say something else here uh, about the petition, uh, it's, uh, the petition question itself. Um, you know very well that uh, uh, the last petition um, attracted opprobrium and, and, and disgust, but also jubilation uh, yeah, in equal measure. Uh, you've seen the critiques of the judgment, right? Uh, and I'm sure you have yours as well. Um, some people um, attribute the, 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 those critiques uh, or to, to perhaps the truncated period for hearing the petition. Personally, I think 14 days is not enough. The problem with uh, that requirement is that it's a constitutional question, and amending it is a Herculean task. 
So there's a problem there. Yes, in respect of that petition. Uh, there is a statement which has given you some uh, concern. And I think you made that statement uh, in uh, 2013. You repeated it in November 2015. And uh, you said, you know, uh, you have the right to disagree, dissent, it's okay, alternative view, there must have been a context mm. or there must have been something which you are of concern or which offended you. Mm. Because if it is in respect of the Raila versus uh, Huru, mm. a winner or a loser, both of them are justified, one of them to celebrate the other one to be dissatisfied. Sure. The winner does not declare himself the winner. The winner. Yes. True. So, uh, was it a misguided missile, or was it a fair comment, or that it was misconceived? What was the context? So, so I think, um, let me just say that, uh, let me go to the petition itself, because I think that's what you're asking. Uh, I think that the, the you go to, I will ask you a specific question on the petition. Mm. I'm asking you about the statement first. Comment on the statement first. No, no, no. The it context. Was, it was not misguided at yes. all. It, it, you know, the, the statement is, is a well thought out statement. It, as I said before, it was a statement I made as a, as a private citizen <coughs> looking at my government and expressing a view about it. Um, uh, uh, the statement itself is, 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 is not illegal. Uh, it's an expression of uh, a free thought by uh, a free citizen in a democratic state. Uh, as I said before, uh, you know, in any state, meaning country, People have different views about their leadership. Uh, and people express those views. Uh, I express my view about the leadership at the time uh, because I was convinced that I was right. So uh, I, I don't take it back. I don't. I, I simply think that uh, time has moved, you know? Um, and, uh, and we're in a different context now. Uh, the, the cases at the ICC have been dismissed. So part of that concern uh, that I had, you know, is addressed by that dismissal of the cases. If the cases were still ongoing, I would have concern. Um, uh, you know, but the cases were gone. Uh, I think um, in terms of governance, there are some things that I would like to see happen in this country. I would like to see the government of the day address corruption, address insecurity, you know, do many things so that it, it can earn my loyalty. I'm a citizen after all. Okay, Professor, now let's go to specifics about the, the Raila petition. Yes. Tell us which of, were of concern to you and mm. how you would intend to improve as a chief justice. Yes. And if they are none, you can tell me they are none. Yeah, no, 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 that's quite okay. Um, like I said, I think it was a rushed uh, opinion. Um, and that is not to impugn the integrity of the judges. It's to say that they had a very short window with which to work. Uh, I think, um, I, but I think they got it wrong within that short window. Uh, but I also think they got some things right. Just before I go, I say what is wrong. Uh, I think, for example, they opened a presidential petition to the cameras. That's huge. It's a very sensitive issue. They let the cameras in. In many countries, that will be a closed issue. So that's a fantastic thing that happened. Secondly, 
the Supreme Court moved Suomoto to us for scrutiny. That's fantastic. Because when the facts are not clear and no one is coming forward with them, someone must ask questions. And so they ask for scrutiny. So that's a great thing. I think where there is a problem with the presidential petition is one, I, I am comfortable with the burden of proof um, that they established between a balance of probabilities and beyond a reasonable order, somewhere in there. It's still murky, but you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in an actual adjudication, you will know why, wh whether it has been met. And I think that, that's good guidance for the lower courts, for the high court that hears election petitions, to know that this is the, the burden of proof, uh, resolving that question. I think where I have a problem is in how the Supreme Court then took that burden of proof and applied it in the petition. You know, I think that if you look at um, the, the failures, systemic failures of the IABC, electronic, register-wise, and so on and so on, if you look at all those failures, um, uh, those failures are, you, are huge failures. In any other society, that election would have been declared invalid. Or at least, you know, the court would have said, let's do a rerun. So, so the way that burden of proof was applied to the, to the to, to, did not take into account the gross failures of the IABC. And I think they let them off the hook. Although they said in the end, you know, you can investigate them and so on and so forth, but they let them off the hook. The second thing that I think I want to, uh, to mention here, uh, uh, you know, uh, was um, uh, not on the burden of proof, but you know, the, yeah, so, 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 you know, the, the burden of proof, you know, is really one thing, that, but let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just, you know, leave it there. That is a major thing that, that, uh, that I think was an issue for me um, in, that, in that, because when, if you cannot really um, audit the system, the electoral system, that is supposed to measure the will of the electors and determine the will of the electors, how can then the election be valid? That's, that's a major, major problem. I think other people have written about other issues, such as using, using, okay. using, using case law from some jurisdictions. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and you are disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, you have used very strong words against a person who was declared the winner and who had nothing to do with all those deficiencies. Yes. And who maybe who had no role. How come you did not use the same strong words against the Supreme Court? Why? Why is this a uh, contradiction? I, 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 I did not use uh, strong words against the winner. I didn't. Um, I, I used strong words against, against um, uh, the declaration. It, the winner could be X or Y. You substitute the name. It doesn't matter. I would have said the same things. To me, I'm not interested in whether the winner was X or Y. I am interested in the integrity of the process. That's all. You know, I could care less who won the election in 2013, to be quite frank with you. You know, I just wanted the election to have been, to have been won fair and square. Uh, so that's one. The second thing is that um, we are, this is a country of, of laws. And so I think that, you know, for me, um, as, 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 a, as a legal academic, um, uh, you know, courts mean something to me. I disagree with the court, but I respect its opinion. Okay, the point I'm making the professor is this that uh, in a political contest, people offer themselves for elections. Yes. It is the role of IEBC to conduct a fair and transparent elections. Yes. And it is the role of the court to determine whether there is a dispute or whether there are malpractices. Yes. 
And the point I want you to make is that, you see, I, and I'm following up on the statements, and I'm very happy with the, what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. But the point I want you to, uh, to clarify is that you do not use any words against the IEBC. Because you said IEBC was the one responsible for these malpractices. I did. Again, you say that the court was unable to resolve the malpractices. But somebody who was one of the contestants, you have used strong words. So why the contradiction? Well, actually, I, um, I, I, I have expressed my views about the IABC uh, after the election. And I have written extensively about what I think the problems were. Um, uh, I, I was also, I should add, disappointed by the way the Supreme Court managed the petition. I forgot to add this. Manage the petition. Okay, let's move now. Yes. Uh, there is an issue also which you had a discussion with uh, my brother, Justice Michelule. Yes. On Article uh, 27. Article 27. Of the Constitution. Yes. And you put a lot of premium on the issue of uh, Equal protection, yes. non-discrimination. Yes. If you go to Article 11, yes. the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya recognizes culture as the foundation of the nation. Um, what you're reading, uh, Article 11? Article 11, yes. Yes, yes. Culture. Yes. Yes. And Article 45 yes. deals with marriage. Yes. And it recognizes marriage in the form of tradition, religion, religious systems, mm -hmm. or personal or family law. Yes. Uh, Article 25, mm. Article 45 also deals with, uh, recognizes family, recognizes and protects family values. Yes. And it says clearly, marriage is the union of two persons of opposite sex. Yes. What is your view on the issue of gays and lesbianism in the clear provisions of Article 45, 11, and 27, and in fact that, Equal treatment means different things, especially if you change your status as a result of your choice yes. and as a result of what you believe is right. But the society, culture, and values has been specifically mm -hmm. and categorically protected. Yes. Do you still believe that the Constitution protects and that there is the issue of non-discrimination against gays and uh, lesbians, unions. Yes, Judge. Um, uh, let me preface by saying that uh, this is a speaking constitution. Uh, so um, the, the statement that, uh, that a provision is clear, you know, must be interpreted in the context of a dynamic document. Uh, and especially on issues on which Kenyans have disputes. That's number one. And I would say to you that the question of um, uh, LGBTI persons in our society is one of those issues on which there's dispute. Okay? I think, Professor, I must. In Bomas, where you and I were, yes. there were three questions that were beyond dispute. One was the death penalty. People like you and me wanted to abolish the death penalty. Which do you do? The, no? public, the public refused. The other issue was this issue of LGBT. We debated it, debated it, and the public refused it. The third issue was abortion. So it is not true that the, what was captured was captured by accident. 
it is that the majority refused it. Now you and I can continue to have a conversation. Which we will. Thank you, AG. I thought that's what I was saying. The, uh, the constitution is very clear. So can I, can, I, can I respond? I'm satisfied. I will go to the next question. Let us open article 163. 163. Yes. I'm there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it says the Supreme Court shall be properly constituted for purposes of proceedings if it is composed of five judges. Yes. What, in your view, does that article mean in terms of substantive and procedural resolution of matters that are filed before the Supreme Court? Um, as I said, that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of the Constitution. Um, it is not a frivolous institution. It is not just any other court or arm of government. When the Supreme Court speaks, Kenyans must know that it has spoken with validity, with legal validity. There can be no question as to whether the Supreme Court um, was speaking with its full power and force. Prof, I want to interrupt you again. I wish you can just answer the question. Yes. Yeah, so, please come to the question. Yeah, so, so but, but, but this is part of the answer, Madam Chair. So this is, uh, so the, the, the uh, only a majority of the court, in my view, a majority of the court can speak for it. In this particular case, the framers thought that um, it should be majority plus one. And I think the question there is... Oh, Professor, whether you are getting my question. Yes, no, I'm getting the question. The question is whether the... Other than what the Constitution is stating... Yes. ...as a bench of five... Yes. ...whether the court or a single judge or a uh, two-judge bench... Yes. ...or a three-judge bench... Yes. ...have powers to resolve or determine an issue which is substantive or no, which no, no. is procedural. No, 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 that I mean, is the that's point what I was saying. I'm just, yes. I was just simply saying that, 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 that you know, a single judge or a two-judge bench has no power at all to resolve a sub sub substantive issue. But um, they can, uh, a single judge or, or a two-judge bench can issue uh, 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 a procedural uh, preliminary, you know, uh, holding, if you will, uh, ruling, not nothing substantial. What is, in your view, a procedural issue? Uh, procedural issues are, you know, uh, questions that will preserve the status quo. If there's an injury that might might arise, uh, there are issues of scheduling. You know, that could those could be there. Uh, uh, as long as the scheduling issue does not uh, deny justice. Are you asking justice who believes that a single judge of the Supreme Court mm. or a two-judge bench of the Supreme Court mm. can issue an interlocutory order to, substa uh, to, to preserve uh, the substance or the substratum of the dispute? I think that um, as long as the order does not change status quo ante, it's fine. And as long as it also conforms with the rules of the court, it, 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 there has to be conformity. You know, there has to be conformity with the rules of the court. Um, I have. Three questions, Professor. Yes. What is your legal or political philosophy? 
Oh my goodness. And do you belong to any political party? I do not belong to any political party. I have never belonged to a political party in my life. Uh, I have never held a party position. Um, uh, I have, uh, shall I say, views about political parties that I will not share. But uh, you know, I just think that um, you know, uh, it is not the place for someone like me to be belong to a political party. Uh, s secondly, um, the, the, you know, um, uh, if I can just reduce it to to the bare minimum, uh, I would say that I am a social democrat, meaning that I believe in social justice, I believe in democracy. I believe in equal protection and the rule of law. I also believe in, in, in equal opportunity for economic and social chances in society. That's why I'm a social democrat, you know, because I, I also believe that, uh, you know, the state should give economic meaning to the lives of citizens. That it is not simply a question of politics, it's also a question of economics. Would you term yourself as a conservative judge, a conservative chief justice, a radical one, or a mainstream uh, chief justice? I think I would say that uh, I would be a chief justice who has fidelity to the law. Uh, I, I, uh, these labels do not mean much to me. Uh, as long as the, the chief justice obeys the constitution, lives by it, uh, rules by, you know, uh, rules is ruled by it himself in the Constitution. That's all. And lastly, Professor, mm. you have talked about the issue of public confidence and that, that your Chief Justice will give uh, justice to all Kenyans. Yes. And uh, that uh, your role will be to uphold the values in the Constitution. Yes. There are three things that have direct connotations to each other, in my view, and you have the right to dispute it. Yes. Power, tribalism, and justice. Mm -hmm. What do you see to be the role, and that is the elephant in this country, mm. where people do not want to discuss. What do you see to be the role of tribalism in achieving justice for ordinary citizens in this country? And that's my last question, and I wish you well. Yes, no, thank you. I thank you, Judge Osame. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, we have talked until we cannot talk anymore about tribalism. It's, uh, we have run out of vocabulary. The English language is not rich enough to express our disgust for tribalism. Uh, and the kind of corrosions that tribalism has engendered in our society. Uh, many of us, um, many Kenyans, I would say most Kenyans, first belong to a tribe and then belong to the nation. I think Kenyans should first of all belong to the country as a, as the pri as a primary identity and then belong to an ethnic group or a race as a, as a secondary identity, where we will see people uh, for the character of their persons, not, their, not the name of their ethnicity. Uh, as long as we keep on this path, uh, we will never be able to address these issues of corruption and inequity. I think, uh, so for example, public offices, you know, who is employed where, you know? I mean, you can go to offices and you find that they belong to one group. Uh, the one thing that I, I, I just want to, to say before I seat ground is that devolution is a game changer on the question of ethnicity. Because for the first time, resources are going to areas that were God forsaken for lack of a better word. Uh, uh, let me just say one thing and then I'll, I'll, 
uh, I'll see the ground. Uh, when I ran the Truth Commission Task Force, I went to Wajir, and I had a big rally with people there. I think we got about 2,000 people to come to the rally, and we spoke and we, we listened to the testimonies of Kenyans. After the testimonies, one woman came to me, and she asked me, how is Kenya? And I said, what do you mean? Uh, are you not in Kenya? It was a very perplexing question. I never heard it asked. She said, no, I'm not in Kenya. Kenya begins at Mwingi. That is the thing that we, we must address. Thank you. Uh, AG, do you have any, or should we go directly to Professor Jenda? Professor Jenda. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's past 1 p.m. Prof Professor, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether you came with your crystal ball. Or you <laughs> 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 left it in New York. Um, uh, yeah, j j j just a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this tweet, many questions have been asked about your 2014 tweet, but the tweet seems current. Because mm. it, what, what you said then, and maybe I just want to paraphrase, is that as a matter of freedom of conscience and thought, I can't accept Uhuru Kenyatta as president of Kenya. Mm -hmm. Then you said, I can't, mm -hmm. and I won't. Yes. Then you say, my views haven't changed and won't change. Yes. Have they changed? Um, I, I would say that um, 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 the, the first part of that, uh, of that uh, statement um, uh, is true. Uh, it was true at the time I said it. Um, so, so they have changed? I, no, I'll just say this. No, no, no. I, I will say this. I'll say that uh, I said earlier that, uh, that the cases were dismissed. That's important to me. Yeah. So they have changed? I have said that... As uh, of this morning... No, 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 no. I've not said that. What I've said, what I've said is that I have... I've said there are other issues. I have other issues, questions of corruption and so on and so forth, that, that I think still trouble me. Um, speaking as a Kenyan citizen, that I want addressed. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that, that Kenyan cup. Mm -hmm. is, your, is your allegiance to Kenya incremental? Is it based on, is it a conditional love that you have for your country, or it is? No, not, not at all. I mean, I think um, uh, I think I mentioned, Professor, that um, uh, I don't want to, to 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 raise questions about other Kenyans who live in the diaspora because I think they also love their country very much, and as you know, they contribute a lot to this country. There's no question about it. But I would say that um, you know, speaking just for myself, uh, I seek no ground to anyone on the question of being a patriot for this country. I seek no ground. Uh, some of the things that I have said, in fact, and done, uh, are things that, on the face of them, uh, would, deny me, would actually deny me benefits. You know? uh, because, and, and, I, when, and the question that one I would have to ask at the end of the day is why is the professor making a particular statement knowing that that statement will upset some people in Kenya, you know? It's because I believe in this country and I have a conscience. That's why, and I love it. I love this country. The, 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 but if you look at Article 166, yes. upon your success in this process, you are interviewed. Yes. The president shall, you, the appointment is, nomination is done then, an appointment is done. Yes. Um, so your views would change upon nomination? 
The views will not, what, what I'm trying to say is this. Uh, I have never disputed the fact that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta was elected, was declared president and confirmed by the Supreme Court. I never disputed that. Never disputed that. Who, who so am I to dispute what, what, uh, what, what the, the facts on the ground are? And in law, it, Mr. Kenyatta is a de jure and the de facto president. My you know, statement notwithstanding. Prof, I think uh, that, that's, that's, an, interesting, uh, that, that's an, inter an interesting position that you take. But I, I want to just uh, move further. Yes. Uh, further, and basically this touches on your, a number of articles that you have written. Yes. On of, of governments. Yes. And you then say in your writing, and this is, this is supported by uh, views of other writers, like Ernest Duga of Yaounde Do, I'm yes. sure uh, uh, you, you wrote then that uh, the African state is an amalgam of many nations and largely disjointed. Um, recently, the uh, High Court in Mombasa uh, ruled in the case of Randun Zai, an internal security, Minister of Internal Security, on the Mombasa Republican Council, yes. basically affirming self determination yes. um, as a principle. Of Mm. and I want to hear your views, whether you believe that the right to self-determine is an absolute right, and whether cessation in your view mm. is a right that should be open to the people to exercise. Yes. Do you believe in expansive or restrictive self-determination? And, and under the Constitution, just tell me what your views are because yes. you believe that ethnicities should be promoted or that nationhood, small nations within the wider states that we have should be promoted. Yeah, so, so no, no, thank you very much. Um, you know, the, the, I'm always pleased when people go back to articles I wrote 20 years ago and ask me questions. It, it, it means my work is still relevant. Um, yes, uh, of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, <coughs> Well, let me, uh, let me say that self-determination is a loaded term. And it is not one of those things that you play with as a court or as a political society. It is something that uh, has to be approached with the, with the utmost sobriety. Uh, there are some standards in international law under which self-determination can be exercised by a group. Uh, and those standards are not, um, you know, are not, are restrictive standards. Um, uh, I think for, 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 for a group that inheres within a state, let us say, for example, if the Kambas want to secede and uh, go to another country or form their own country. Um, Should, would they be allowed? Should they be allowed? No, they, they will not be allowed unless, unless the state of which they are a part either becomes genocidal towards them or denies them the basic freedoms under which they can flourish as a, as a group. Not as, not, not as individuals, but as a group. Uh, in that case, um, uh, secession might be allowed um, uh, secondly, I think um, um, the right of self-determination never really goes away. Also, let us understand that. It's inherent. It never goes away. The only question is when it can be exercised and whether a threshold has been met for that right to be exercised. So. I mean, uh, I think to me it is, uh, it is a moot point uh, that a group has a right to, uh, to advocate secession. So if you are sitting in a determination, you would promote that idea? 
No, 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 I will not promote anything, uh, Professor. I, I'm, I'm simply saying that I would recognize that the right is inherent, um, mm. and um, whoever was seeking to secede, they would have to meet a certain, you know, uh, burden of proof. Okay, I'm happy with that. Let me move to the second question, yes. uh, which is, um, uh, again, in an article that you wrote uh, on religion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is an article that you wrote on... Um, cultural integrity. Yes. And you will recall that uh, you then talked about two rights. The right to religion, freedom of religion. Yes. And the right uh, uh, to be left alone. You argue that it includes the, li the right to be left alone to practice whatever religion you want to practice. Yes. Do you belong to a religion? Um, let me say this. Uh, um, uh, I was uh, raised as a Catholic, yeah. and uh, I actually almost became a priest. It was it was in my future, but it was not to be. Uh, at some point, I took the wrong turn. Um, I would say that um, I uh, do not belong to any organized religion. Are you an atheist? I am not an atheist. But I don't belong to an organized religion. Are you, are you, he, are you hidden? No, 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 I'm not. How I, do you I, describe yourself? I'm a, I, I, I would say that, um, uh, so for example, um, I believe, I appreciate the theology of compassion. So for example, what, what, um, you know, uh, you know what, what the Pope has been doing has really got me excited about what he is doing. It's great stuff, uh, or what Mother Teresa was doing in Calcutta, you know, great stuff. Um, what, uh, you know, Muslims do, uh, you know, to give alms to the poor, I, wonderful stuff. So, no, I, 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 I would simply say that I don't belong to organized religion, but I, I find many of the values in the various religions to be admirable. So if, uh, Shouldn't Kenyans be worried about uh, the c type of chief justice uh, that we recommend mm. uh, if we are not even sure what religion you belong to or what, what your faith? No, because, because... it's not clear what your faith is. Is it, would you describe it as Christian, non-Christian, Muslim, Hindu, or none of the above? I think that the, I think that uh, the the uh, you know uh, the, the, the the holy book says you shall know them by their deeds, <laughs> not by their words. <laughs> and and and, uh, and so I think that it is not even if I told you what uh, you know it will not be useful. I think it is just uh, you know I think that we 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 should aspire to live a life of virtue, and that's what's important to me. It is not a label. <laughs> Let me move to the next point. Now, you, you share a lot with the uh, Chief Justice of the US, John Roberts. Yes. Uh, I think the, this place of birth and probably where you have honed your scholarship. Yes. Uh, Buffalo. Yes. Yeah, it's the same. He was born there, yes. Uh, yeah, his philosophy, of course, is a conservative judicial philosophy. You have described yourself as a social democrat. Yes. What are those ideals that you think or that you will bring to the judiciary mm. that are transformative in nature yes. and that will, will build on what Chief Justice Mutunga achieved? Yes. Yeah. So and, I, I or, or, and, and, and just as you answer that, do you think that did he perform to your expectation? Did he? Yes. Oh, yes. Perform okay. to your expectation yeah, yeah. as you answer that question. Yeah. So, as, as to uh, first to Chief Justice uh, Roberts, um, I've actually welcomed him uh, to the area. I went to welcome him to the area when he came to visit uh, uh, the Buffalo area um, uh, to give a talk at the Jackson Center. Um, um, uh, as to judicial philosophy, I think uh, I would be divergent from his view. Uh, he's very socially conservative, uh, although he's, he's shown some signs of modulating his positions uh, uh, as Chief Justice. 
as evidenced by, for example, the ruling on Obamacare that he, 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 he upheld that, that particular law, which was an attack by many, by many conservatives. Um, but let me say this uh, about um, uh, what philosophy I'll bring to the judiciary. I've said before that um, this constitution permits all that which it does not prohibit. It permits all that which it does not prohibit. And so if you look at the Constitution as uh, how many pages, I don't know, this is perhaps printed in, uh, in small font. Um, uh, there's a lot of area that is not, uh, is permitted that is not prohibited. Um, and uh, that's how I read the Constitution. I read the Constitution as a document that liberates, not that which constrains. So that, for example, if there is a tie between the speaker and the censor, my vote goes to the speaker, right? So mine is a permitting doctrine of law that says that the Constitution's spirit is to free people. It's not to constrain them. It is also to give people the power to, um, to, to tame their own state. Because as you know, the Constitution places the state below the people. Uh, the Constitution places the state organs <coughs> below the people. Uh, so it is, it is a document that, is, that enables. Uh, to, to, to Commissioner Desch's um, uh, earlier questions about, about uh, the savages and so on and so forth. It's a constitution that disdains savagery, in quotes. In other words, um, to the extent that there is, an ab that there is a, a suggestion that a right might be clawed back, the constitution says don't do that. So, 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 so my philosophy is that uh, when, we, when we look at this document, uh, we applied as judges to enable the people of Kenya to realize their full potential, not to constrict their choices. So, so, so you, you develop the text of the Constitution and you give it a purposive meaning? I, what more, more beyond what Scully and Tonin did or you would restrict it? Yes, so what I would do with the Constitution, so there are areas of the Constitution that are gray. And there are areas that are not gray, yeah. you know. And I, I know that the Attorney General was arguing with me about gray and non-gray areas. Uh, you know, of course, I, I, I think I differ with him on, on, on those issues because I think the, the reason why the Constitution, even on the question of the death penalty, for example, uh, uh, Professor Gender, uh, you know, uh, why there is room there uh, it's because Kenyans are still not quite sure what they should do exactly with this issue. Do, do we want as Kenyans to witness people being hanged to death? Do we want our state to wield this kind of violence against the people of this country? On the question of abortion, as you can see very well, it allows many, several, many exceptions in fact, not several, many exceptions. Because Kenyans still want a conversation on this issue. Um, and so, so I would say to, 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 to my dear professor there next to you, uh, to both of you, I would say, you have not expressed your view on it, but you did. Uh, I would say that the, that, that the Constitution on these, on these areas, which are, you know, homosexuality, you know, on abortion, on the death penalty, it leaves room for the Supreme Court to clarify issues. Thank you. I, yes. I, I, I want to ask you a direct question. Yes. What best practices, and this is because I know that you're a, a student, or yes. a professor yes. of international law, yes. and human rights, American law, what best practices would you borrow from the American judicial system and supplant into the Kenyan judicial system to achieve efficiency? Mm. I want you to just, on top of your head, yes. give us I, a number. I, I don't think I want to borrow anything, actually, uh, Professor. Uh, I, I think we should learn 
from other experiences, and then use them to germinate our local jurisprudence. Let, let me say this. Yes. Is there anything particular in the practice of the Federal Court of the U.S. Yes. that you think should be, would instruct the performance of our Supreme Court? Yes. Earlier on, you yes. talked about uh, 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 lack of collegiality. Yes. And the problem that is currently facing the bench of the Supreme Court. Yes. Yeah. What would you borrow to improve? What do you think stands out within the federal court system of the U.S.? Sure. That thank you. No, 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 thank you. I agree with that. I, I, think, f I think the first thing clearly is collegiality. Um, I think uh, those men and women on the U.S. Supreme Court over the years have not always seen eye to eye with that, each other. That's one. But they have always, you know, respected each other. Secondly, I would introduce in the judiciary, uh, especially in the higher courts, not just the Supreme Court, the question of professional clerks. Um, these are individuals who are qualified as lawyers, uh, you know, they can be employed for two, three, four, five years, whatever the case. Sometimes it's a professional line, which is, is long lasting. I think those professional clerks are indispensable to the uh, improvement of the quality of jurisprudence by, by US judges across the board. Because, believe it or not, they do most of the research and give the judges you know, options uh, around which to, to work. So that, that, that is something that I think the JSC would have to think about in terms of allocating funding to hire people on a professional line so that if you are, if you are faced with the question of the death penalty, for example, you know, they can just go and bring you all the sources and the case law that is available, and then you as a judge can then decide what to do. I'm not quite sure how, how uh, equipped right now the courts here are with respect to, to research. One of the definitions that, that we, you learned when you were in law school. Yes. And I'm sure one of the texts that you came across was uh, William Twinning's Law in Context. Yes. Um, and, and there he describes uh, pericles and, and the plumber. Yes. Uh, but it emerges that uh, pericles was actually a plumber. Yes. Uh, do you consider yourself sufficiently equipped with plumbing skills yes. to um, be able to run the Supreme Court? Yeah, one of the things that, a good question, one of the things uh, that uh, I learned very early on as a, as, as, as a lawyer was that first of all, you must know what the law is before you take any other step. I mean, I have many students who come and tell me about the first year that, oh, I don't want to practice law. Okay, but we're in law school. So what I tell them is that, okay, first of all, know what the law is, and then you can think about it. Because unless you know what the law says, you cannot never think about it. So I, I think that there is uh, a sense in which uh, the law can be perceived <laughs> as a craft. Okay, because as you know very well, uh, until 150 years ago, law schools did not exist. People <coughs> learned the law through apprenticeship, right? So through doing. Um, and, 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 and so, so this, 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 this particular part of the law is very important because that's how you adjudicate disputes, especially on the everyday. So that's critical. Then secondly, I think, but you cannot stop there. You have then to intellectualize and complexify the law because the law is a social animal. It's, it's, uh, it's, there is nothing in society that is more powerful than the law. Every facet of our life is governed by law. So it behooves us as lawyers and as academics and as judges to know the policy implications of the law, um, you know, to know the purpose of the law, not just what the law is. Otherwise, we end up um, like those lawyers who um, enabled the Nazis to take power, if you just become legal mechanics. 
Agree with you, Prof. Let me move lastly to the basic structure doctrine and your aware yes. of the case of Casavananda and state of Kerala. Yes. Which basically dealt with the question of flexibility of the constitution. Uh, that there are certain structures in the constitution that cannot be changed. Yes. We have the provisions of Article 256 of our constitution that provides what articles can be changed in what manner. Yes. Either through uh, a referendum or through parliamentary intervention. Yes. As a student of constitutional law, yes. do you believe that there should be limits to constitutional amendment through parliament? Um, first of all, I, 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 I have trouble um, seeing the parliament uh, as a, a forum for amending the constitution. I have trouble with that, first of all. Just because of the history of the country. I mean, look at from 1963 to 19, 1969, 68. Look at the amendments that were passed in rubber stamp parliaments, got essentially gutting the essence of the independence, independence constitution. Um, so I, 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 I have some trouble with that. Secondly, I, I think that the structure of this constitution is such that its amendment should be done by the people, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a plebiscite. Um, the, but also remember that the Constitution is also, in some respects, an anti-democratic document. Anti-democratic. What do I mean by that? By that I mean there are provisions in the Constitution that are very difficult to amend, where the majority uh, of the population cannot amend it. You require a supermajority to amend it and so on and so forth. These are basic, 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 basic precepts. Then finally, I think uh, we, we are aware of the, of uh, Jus Cogens. These are principles of international law that are preemptive. Uh, things like servitude and slavery and so on and so forth. Those are no-go areas. Prof, in winding up, uh, you are certainly, from your interview, you are, you are prepared and okay. it is apparent that you are allegiance to the republic um, is palpable and that uh, you will be willing to take an oath of uh, to be sworn in as chief justice if you are successful by his excellency the president yes why do you keep referring to him as mr kenyatta well because uh, you can also refer me to as mr mutua as opposed to professor mutua nothing i mean uh, or you can even call me macau because we are friends i mean people have many names I mean, I have many, many sort of, not many names, but many titles. Uh, and, you know, your friend next to you is a professor, is attorney general, you are senior counsel, you are a professor, you are a commissioner. I mean, you have many titles. So it's just a choice. It's just a choice. Yes. I, 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 like I said, I have no, I have no um, animus uh, towards him, none. I, I am convinced. Yes. And thank you, Professor. I wish you luck. Thank you very much. And thank you for your questions, uh, Professor Agenda. Yeah. I have a few questions. Yes, Mr. Bett. I, I, in your application. Or shall I say Commissioner Bett instead of Mr. Bett? You well, it matter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in your application, yes. the sentence you've given there, as a scholar, I've mm -hmm. kept Kenya and the large, larger East Africa region, Africa, and indeed the world at the center of my, of my work. I'm just quoting application. Yeah. Now, I just want you to share with us. Can you, can you, can you, uh, I'm sorry, I, someone moved the camera and I did not hear properly the quote. Okay, okay, well, I'm just reading a sentence in your application. Yeah, please. As a scholar, mm. I've kept Kenya, the larger East Africa region, Africa, and indeed the world at the center of my work. Yes, yes, yes. Now, at the moment, there seem to be a scramble for economic opportunities in Africa. Yes. By the global, uh, players yes do you think the continent the continent's interest meaning african interest 
is taken into account and are we or are we likely to uh, suffer from this crumble because uh, we may not be uh, they may take advantage of our disparations or our crisis mm. what would be your advice to the leadership um, <coughs> th this is a question that I have actually um, wrestled with at some great length in my both academic work but also in my role as a public intellectual and one of the things that I have uh, thought about is that um, uh, if you look at the resource reservoirs of the globe Africa is the last frontier we have the most uh, untapped resources, uh, both natural and also human. We're the fastest growing continent in terms of people. So it is no accident that uh, you are seeing uh, gro global leaders trooping to Africa, including to Kenya. I mean, how many leaders has Kenya hosted over the past two years? Uh, it's dizzy, both business and political. Uh, this, uh, this, the, it's wonderful to be, to be a destination, uh, but you must never mistake the interests of those who court you from your own interests. Um, uh, I have um, expressed myself uh, on a number of uh, business ventures uh, that have been undertaken by new investors especially from uh, Asia, where I think that uh, perhaps the people who are, you know, arguing about the fine print are not always fully awake. Uh, I think that's an area that should so concern us. What would be your advice to the African leadership? My, my advice is that, um, is that many of these agreements appear to be signed in darkness without full disclosure. Um, I, 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 would, I would say that we should, we should uh, this is not an area for a judge, uh, but since you've asked the question, it's a political question, I'll answer it. Um, you know, much of this, if we are signing it, agreements of this nature, there should be some, there should be more public scrutiny. Uh, and our leaders, uh, not just in Kenya, but across Africa should put these agreements on display so people can debate them. But also, secondly, that, uh, that, that, that there can be discussion between, between, between the communities that are affected uh, and, and the investors and the government. Uh, I just, um, I, I say this because I know that in certain cases in this country, concessions have been given to investors in, in circumstances that are unclear. Good, thank you. So your recommendation is public participation? It's public participation and the pro, you know, public scrutiny. Okay, yeah. good. Um, and transparency. Let's move to the second one. Election Campaigns Finance Act 2013 empowers IBC yes. to make regulations and uh, also uh, guidelines to operationalize that act in terms of the amounts of money candidates and parties can spend mm. for campaigns. Mm. Um, people have seen the limits which have been set, and uh, there seem to be an argument that uh, IBC is making uh, politics a game of the rich. Um, of course, uh, the politicians are saying we also need to spend money mm. to reach the people. Mm -hmm. What is your view on how can IBC uh, track this and do you think they'll manage it? Um, so I think, first of all, let me say that there should be campaign finance reform. That is a baseline. Uh, I think that money should not talk louder than the vote of one citizen. And, and, and the vote should not be liable to be bought. Uh, and so there, there has to be, if we want our democracy to thrive, 
and to be the kind to give us the kind of society that this constitution envisages we have to take money out of politics there is no reason where why the public cannot be the one that funds campaigns as opposed to individuals and corporations there is no reason for that uh, I'll, I'll rather go to a completely a complete system of public financing of campaigns. That's what I would do. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have seen it in New, in New York in, as a state that where you don't limit the flow of money into politics, you get corrupt you know, public officials. So I think we need to do that. As for the IBC, um, uh, I think that the IBC uh, has suffered uh, loss of credibility, to put it politely. And I think, in fact, uh, they have agreed to vacate office. So I think we wait to see what new creature uh, will replace it to be able to answer your question in full. You declared that you earn some monies from the Standard Newspaper Group. Yes. And uh, you also indicated that you you actually pay your taxes in the U.S.? Yes. I believe the Kenyan laws requires that all income earned in Kenya must be taxed in Kenya. Where does this place, Professor Mutua? Uh, I think that, um, um, you know, my, my own ethical obligations uh, to, uh, to the tax laws uh, and to avoid double taxation, which would take place, I pay taxes in the United States. So you are indicating that when you earn income in Kenya, you, bought, you don't pay any tax in Kenya? Um, I think there is some, some income that is taken out when I get paid by the standard. Rawe. No, I know it is. I know it is taken out. But I still then end up you know, paying taxes in the United States. That would only happen mm -hmm. if you have a P number. Otherwise, no tax would be taken for whose account. And you indicate that you don't have a P number. So it puts a lot of question on that matter. Well, what I see when I get my slip, my pay slip, is that uh, there is money that is taken out. That's all I can say. But you indicate that you are still, still applying for a P number? Yes. OK. Um, the, uh, maybe my last question. Mm -hmm. uh, within the judiciary, the judges have not been happy about the way complaints are handled. Complaints? Complaints against them. Yes. Uh, can you just share with us what proposals you may be having on how to manage complaints against our judicial staff? So this is judges feeling that the complaints against them are not well handled. Um, I have heard that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that concern, and I think it's, it's, it's serious, um, because first of all, the last thing you want to do is to impugn the integrity of a judge. That's the last thing you want to do. Not only because uh, a judge is, um, supposed to represent legality and fairness. So when the judge's probity and ethics come into question, it becomes a very serious problem. Um, but our constitution also provides citizens with a vast array of choices uh, for expressing their views about public officials, including judges. And I think Kenyans are still trying to find a balance between frivolous uh, lawsuits and complaints and, you know, uh, serious, uh, you know, uh, concerns. Um, and I think all of us are caught in, in this maelstrom uh, of trying to learn how to balance the rights and the obligations of the new constitution. Um, I think judges in the past were not subjected to, to such a barrage 
uh, of complaints. And so the judges are having to feel the heat of the new constitution. Uh, and that's not a bad thing because it keeps the judges on their toes as the judiciary continues to reform itself, right? Um, uh, what I would say simply is that, uh, is that uh, this, this body here, uh, the JSC, ought to think about um, uh, uh, perhaps some structure. Uh, I, I know that, I, I know that uh, there are some other structures like the Ombud and so on, but that's different. Perhaps some other structure, uh, or even the Ombud, if you can be, you know, sort of, it, it, it's mandate can be reimagined. You know, where, co if complaints come there, they are handled in such a way that, um, that no one feels aggrieved. Uh, because I do think, uh, Mr. Bett, that there are some real concerns that citizens have against judges. But I also think there are privileged concerns that they have against some judges. So I think th this balance has to be struck. Professor, thank you, Chair. Chair. Because of the interview, but uh, I just have one more question for you. I yes. Promised me one. Okay. C can you go first, then I wind up. Yeah. Prof, uh, the, the Chair very kindly promised me one question. I'll, I'll make two half questions. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. I hope they amount to one. Where <laughs> yes. you put them? In this country, you are part of a very important tradition of public intellectuals. We've had people like Ali Mazurui, Joe Kadi, William Ochieng. We still have Philip Ochieng with us, commenting very, very robustly on contemporary issues. Uh, you do the same. Uh, maybe some of your critics would say more robustly than uh, is probably uh, comfortable for those you critique. Mm. But you appreciate that a judge speaks through his judgments and that uh, we as a community of lawyers and, and people who consume justice would be incredibly worried if the Chief Justice was tweeting and uh, WhatsApping and uh, Snapchatting and Twittering and uh, all these other things about live business of the court. I would want to get an assurance from you as to how you want to deal with that. The other half question. Yes, uh, that's a full question, uh, Professor, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the other half question is this. One of your most important submissions today is actually your most controversial and, and uh, most disconcerting for me. You state that the Constitution permits all it does not prohibit. Do you want to revisit that as, uh, as, uh, as your jurisprudence? Because if you say that, then we would say that the Constitution is a land law statute, is a family law statute, is a criminal law statute, is a civil procedure statute, uh, that would be very, very far-reaching, more far-reaching jurisprudence than I have heard of. Uh, Chair, I'm sorry I took advantage to uh, ask another one. Please reassure me mm. that in the second sense, you meant something more restrictive than yes. what I understood you to yeah. say. So on the question of uh, tweeting, um, first of all, you're on Twitter yourself. So, so you, really, you really can't point fingers. But, okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let me just say that uh, <clears throat> I think we evolve with the times. Um, <clears throat> the judiciary of yesterday is not the judiciary of today. Uh, the means of communication uh, yesterday are not the means of communication today. I think the question was asked by um, uh, by Ms. Ominda about communication, communicating with the public and, 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 and being open and accessible and so on, so that people can access your thoughts uh, as a Chief Justice. I think there's a proper place for social media by the Chief Justice. However, I think it has to be used with um, an abundance of caution. Um, I don't think that you treat uh, 
the proceedings of the court. I don't think that um, you tweet politics. Um, I think you still have your speech rights, uh, but I think the the <clears throat> I think the, the 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 weight of your office and um, and the, the the seriousness with which citizens um, uh, take your views uh, should make you should should chastise you before you tweet so that you can discipline your tweets. Final question, which I've been kind of persuaded yeah. to to think that I should ask you this question. Yes. There is a held view that uh, intellectuals do not make very good hands <laughs> of public institutions. Yes. Therefore, they are best for innovation, research, and a lot of engagement with graduate students. Yes. So they tend to be wired that way. Now, yes. in your view, mm. and looking at Kenyan context, have you reflected what kind of personal development program you may need to be able to fit to this position <laughs> of chief justice? Should we consider you? <laughs> yes. Well, I think, for, uh, Madam Chair, you know, you, you are an intellectual yourself, and you have done very well in, uh, in public service. So maybe the premise of your question can be contested. Uh, or perhaps not. I don't want to incur your wrath. Uh, Unless, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so I think there is uh, a view that there is the world of the academy and there is the world of uh, reality and the twain shall never meet. Uh, and I think that's not a view that I, I share. Uh, I think that quite, quite frankly, uh, people who do not do well in public service do not do well simply because either they have no training or they are bad training uh, or they're incompetent for, for one reason or another. It's not because they're academics or they're non-academics. Uh, that said, I take the premise of your question seriously, which is that uh, you know when you transition from one uh, sector to another, uh, or a subsector, from one sub subsector to another subsector, you need to learn the traditions of the subsector to which you are transitioning. Okay? So, so principally, I have been an academic. You know, I've not been a judge, uh, as, 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 as it's evident. Um, I would have to learn the traditions and the mores of the judiciary. Uh, you know, that's just, uh, that goes without saying. And, uh, and um, uh, you know, and part of that learning, by the way, is not that, the, that there is a course you go and take. Uh, I think it is simply um, interacting in a fruitful way with your colleagues. Um, when you become, when we hire a professor, you know, and I used to hire professors, in their first two years, we would, we would just make sure that they had senior professors with them who would advise them on how to develop scholarship, how to teach, you know, because sometimes you, you, people think professors are very tough, but uh, many other times that a professor has come to me almost in tears because the teaching was too difficult, you know? And so then you have to mentor those people. So I think, I think uh, I, as Chief Justice, I would not be averse to learning from the people whom I would find in the judiciary. I would not be averse. Thank you very much, Prof. I think on behalf of JSC, we have done justice to this conversation, and we want to thank you very much for coming and engaging with us. Can I say one more word? I was going to that. Yeah. We always give our, our um, uh, interviewee an opportunity because we have been asking you a lot of questions. Yes. Do we have a comment, ask a question, or is there anything else you would want to say regarding this process? I think we'll give you the floor. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I want to thank every member of the commission for a very thoughtful questions, uh, all of them very probing that you've asked me. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the interview, thoroughly enjoyed the interview. There was not one second where I did not feel that uh, 
We were doing what we were supposed to do. So I thank you for that. You have executed your mandate, uh, as they say, to a T. Um, uh, secondly, um, I, I just want to say that this is a solemn process. Uh, I think the whole country is, is, is watching. Uh, and I think that uh, the credibility of the next, or the person that you propose will depend on the process itself. Uh, and, and so that is something that I think is there. But, but I also want to say that uh, there was a question earlier about whether I was carried and brought here by uh, a, a cartel, and I know where that question is coming from. I will not say more. But I'll simply say no, um, I am my own man. Um, and those who know me with, well within the group, and there are some who do, know that. Um, uh, uh, I think there was a question that I missed uh, from Professor Ogenda whether, whether the former Chief Justice was successful. I just want to say I'm not running away from the Chief Justice. I think he did wonderful things in the judiciary. I think there are other things he could have done better, and I think even he himself knows that. But I think we have him to thank for laying the foundation for the next Chief Justice to take this judiciary to the, to the next level. Uh, I think with respect to the JSC, you guys, uh, you, you men and women are extremely important. I don't need to tell you that. You know that. Um, and I think the success of our judiciary is going to depend on how you as a commission work with the next chief justice. That's critical in my view. You know, so I want to leave that with you as well. It's, uh, th you know, these things are, you know, it's a two-way street. You see, as they say, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's critical that, that that relationship be very healthy uh, and productive. For, for, for this thing to work. Finally, I had brought my books here because I knew that um, uh, some of you would uh, 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 carry out an inquisition of my scholarship, <laughs> <laughs> which you did, but I don't want to carry them back to New York. So I want to not donate the books to Professor Ogenda so he can give them to the JTI. Okay? Thank you very much. Yes. Prof, thank you very much. We all wish you well, and uh, I think we will let you go. And the CRJ will escort you as you go. Thank you. We are very happy to have had this engagement. It is not an inducement.